Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's I'm a Keys webinar. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'll keep the introduction brief. Uh, we have an hour today in terms of the presentation and the Q&A. Uh, the topic is from idea to impact re-engineering for sustainability, presented by uh, Tom Fester. Uh, I'll hand over to in a second. Uh, just to briefly let you know some quick guidelines. Uh, in terms of questions during the presentation, you should be able to see uh, an attendee chat box. Feel free to put questions into that box there. And what we'll try and do is answer as many of those as we can with the 15 to 20 minutes that we have remaining at the end of the presentation. But without further ado, I'll hand over to Tom to do the presentation today. So hello, everyone. Um, yes, my name is Tom Fester. Um, I'm an IMECI associate um, in the learning and development uh, uh, area. But um, just so you know, my background is uh, engineering in the automotive sector. I've spent uh, 20 years uh, working for uh, BMW and actually leading some of the uh, new product introductions for Mini uh, into the market. So that, that's a little bit about me. So um, let me take my face off the uh, webinar and uh, try and switch to the uh, presentation that uh, we've got prepared for you today. So that should be coming through. Um, here we go. Okay, um, let's get going. So what we're gonna talk about today is um, uh, re-engineering for sustainability. Um, many of you will already be involved in uh, product and uh, production uh, engineering uh, with the sustainability in mind. Um, so this webinar, what we're going to look at is uh, why it's so important to consider both the product and production uh, simultaneously. Um, we're going to look at some of the best practices out there um, that have integrated uh, sustainability into the engineering and also um, begin to better engage with this uh, unit of uh, CO2 or CO2E, um, which I'll elaborate a, a little bit more. But as I said, I have been working in the automotive industry um, for, for many years. Um, I just want to share a, a, a couple, a few numbers there. Um, so a typical car in the UK will weigh um, about 1.4 tonnes. Um, the amount of uh, CO2 that's actually produced in the manufacture of that car will probably be about four to five tons. So there's the big um, interesting fact. There's a lot more CO2 that's pre produced than the actual weight of the product at the end uh, that you're left with. And then when that product goes into service, the car, it will then produce between 20 and 30 tons of uh, CO2. So a car that weighs uh, 1.4 tons, you can see produces a lot of CO2, and we've got a lot of cars out there. Anyhow, what I'm going to go through today is some uh, challenges when it comes to uh, engineering for sustainability. I want to share with you some case studies and um, point you to where you can learn some more, and then hopefully answer some questions uh, that you may have in the uh, chat. So some challenges then. There's still a lot of um, public misconceptions uh, out there, um, some with some truth. Um, so you often hear that uh, sustainable products don't work as well, or they're just done for marketing, they don't really make a big impact, or it's a China in the US that need to change. Um, some truth in those, um, but, but doesn't have to be true if you engineer the product circuit correctly. Also, plastic should be avoided. Not true at all. Recycling doesn't work. Not true at all. Although even some of our politicians uh, have uh, said this in uh, public forums. Um, and then sustainable products cost more, not affordable. Not necessarily true. The reality is that sustainable products are being demanded, increasingly being demanded by uh, consumers and uh, governments are really mandating um, sustainable products uh, through legislation and uh, incentives. Also, shareholders that are investing in large companies are also uh, um, demanding that those companies act in a very sustainable way. And um, I think 
today, I mean, there's a bit of a revolt going with three pension companies uh, um, going to be voting against uh, BP, for example, because um, they're not quite um, adhering to the targets they um, said that they would do, uh, sustainability targets. So as engineers, we've got a lot of leverage and um, there's a lot of research uh, out there that shows that um, during the um, early design stage or design stage of uh, products, 80% of the product's uh, lifetime's emissions are, are determined at this stage. All right. So product engineers, obviously, they're going to be specifying uh, materials and, and also um, specifying directly or indirectly the, the forming and joining uh, processes, which uh, obviously take uh, a lot of energy. Once these decisions are made and once these uh, engineering um, releases are done, you'll find that it's actually very rare that these uh, um, decisions are completely changed or, or during the lifetime of the product. So engineers really do need to be cognizant of what is it that they're specifying. More and more so now, um, the engineers have this dual mission um of actually making something that's going to be profitable and something that needs to be sustainable i mean back in the day when i first started um engineering products it was more about profitability and uh, I, I remember um seeing a definition of an engineer it's um, somebody can make for five pounds that anybody can make uh, for 50. so profitability and uh, costs uh, were very much uh, in my mind when I was designing um, uh, parts for automotive uh, uh, companies. Um, but nowadays, I mean, sustainability uh, also needs to be delivered. And it's particularly in the automotive industry that that's uh, very, very true because of uh, so much legislation that's uh, uh, coming through. So engineers have got this dual mission now, profitability and sustainability. And a lot of technical decisions um, will sort of bring these two together and, and they will mesh in the, the right way if approached in, in, the, in the, the right systematic uh, way. So really the, the first thing that engineers need to be doing is obviously looking at what is the product, uh, how is it defined, does it meet uh, the, the consumer requirements. But in, in parallel, um, it needs to understand um, how is it going to be produced, what does the supply chain uh, Going to, going to look like uh, where did the raw materials uh, come from so engineers really do need to work with supply chain teams purchasing and uh, collaborate uh, with uh, many uh, many facets of the business and within the business itself the company that they're working for but also um, uh, the companies that supply and uh, utilize the products for that to happen, engineers do need to understand um, quite a few things. And where CO2 or CO2E um, is uh, produced is something that we all need to understand. What this slide there shows is um, the uh, protocol of uh, greenhouse gases, which essentially um, breaks, is broken down into um, three scopes, one, two, and three. So the reporting company um, that's actually making the product uh, will report to scope one. Um, and some companies stop there and um, they manage to uh, get to net zero for scope one and then um, advertise the fact um, that they're um, net zero. But in actual fact, they may have moved much of um, of the CO2 emitting uh, processes uh, into um, scope three, um, back into supply chain or actually um, where, the, where the downstream activities are. Um, and, and this is a sort of greenwashing where people or companies become very selective. Um, so the, the days where this was sort of not well understood and the public could be fooled, I think, are. Uh, going to be behind us uh, if not already but very soon the important thing is that companies understand 
the uh, upstream and downstream activities uh, that the supply chain and how the consumer is going to interact uh, with the product and understand uh, what CO2 is going to be uh, emitted. And the actual fact, the uh, scope to where does the energy uh, come from in order to manufacture the, the, the product. In the cloud, what you can see is um, CO2 on the left, but we also have um, uh, CH4, which is methane, um, and, and then uh, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, uh, uh, plurifluorocarbons, uh, sulfur, um, hexafluoride, and uh, nitro trifluoride. Now, engineers need to be aware. I mean, if where these things are being produced, where these compounds are um, being produced in the, in the manufacturing processes. So CO2, I've explained um, the, the, for the car example, uh, a car that weighs uh, 1.4 tonnes will produce um, 30 tonnes of uh, scope 3 downstream. Uh, but what people need to also understand is um, these uh, equivalents. Now, if I take methane, for example, um, one tonne of methane uh, equates to 25 tonnes of CO2. So if you're production process is uh, you know producing a lot of uh, methane then th th there you have it um, it's it's very very bad a matter, a matter of uh, 25 times worse so when you get companies like uh, some of the oil companies that are choosing to flare off natural gases which is predominantly uh, methane uh, and then um, some of the public begin to understand actually, this is a bad thing for the environment, um, then in their frustration, they will form groups uh, like Stop Oil. Um, but as engineers, we, we can capture some, some of those uh, uh, gases and um, uh, store them. Um, so if you come to the, um, the, the courses that we run, um, with learning and development uh, at the IMAQ, then we can uh, uh, go through in more detail where these uh, materials are, uh, are required and they are required um, in order to produce um, much of the electronics that we rely on today. Some base principles um, when designing sustainably, um, th these are the really basic uh, principles that really do apply uh, and um, they're really designed for planet to type uh, base principles. So at the top, um, You've got avoid, and if you can avoid having one of those nasty um, uh, gases, or uh, you avoid using so much energy to produce what you're trying to produce, that's always a good thing. Um, or, or if you can avoid it altogether, then even better. Um, and that obviously has uh, least impact on the uh, planet. I mean, if you have to use it, then can you reduce it? Um, the, the amounts uh, that, that we produce can always be reduced. Uh, reduced and then re if you have to produce something then can you reuse it can you recover it and then the way it's disposed I mean if you're having to um, put it into landfill that's probably one of the worst things uh, we can do particularly if it continues to emit uh, some uh, CO2 so th this uh, pyramid shows um, it, I mean, we're, we're engineers need to be thinking how engineers need to be thinking so avoid reduce at the very top reuse recover sort of secondary and dispose don't do that to try and um, have a, a design that doesn't require uh, much or any disposal so we've got um, systems thinking where we got the product and the production um, need to be thought of uh, simultaneously and then we got some basic uh, principles uh, for design for planet. Now, if we elaborate on that, then um, we, we need to start thinking about the circularity of the uh, the products that we're um, um, designing, uh, and, and they will exist in that sort of a circular economy. Uh, and much of this now is becoming uh, to be monetized. So, uh, actually, the um, the money makes it flow now because it's. Um, um, a profitable thing to do, as, as well as um, being a sustainable thing to do. 
So, so we've got some materials, particularly in the automotive industry. If I take uh, steel, you can, I think 50% of the cars already uh, recovered steel, uh, the car body. Um, and you can go around and recover and uh, reuse the steel and what was a car can be crushed and become a car. Um, that's almost, uh, you can go around that loop for, um, for infinity. Same is true for uh, aluminium. There's a term called green aluminium. Uh, same is true for some plastics, um, PET uh, in particular. Um, um, many um, plastic bottles are made from PET. You'll find now that um, um, materials um, for, for, for cars, uh, for seat materials, are, are made from PET uh, recycled uh, materials. So the automotive industry probably you know, was or well, still is to some extent, one of the biggest pariah of uh, CO2 and um, uh, as an industry is rethinking the, the way it works. Not only the, the drivetrain, which is the obvious part, but I mean, the, the entire car. And I've got a good example uh, later on of um, uh, some of the latest thinking there. There are some best practices. Um, it, the EFQM uh, uh, team now, I mean, they used to have a very linear approach to um, de developing products and production and uh, viewing businesses. They're, they're now increasingly, if you look at their models, it's much more of a circular type of thinking. So we've got EFQM, which are essentially um, um, saying the same thing. Engineer out waste, engineer out pollution, avoid them. Um, Keep products and materials in use for as long as possible. So products, why should they last five years, 10 years? Why can't they last for 20 years? Um, the right to repair and keeping those products, um, if designed in the right way, in um, use is always a great thing because then you don't have to obviously dispose or re recreate. And um, increasingly now, um, Designs should be done within these circular systems. I've mentioned a few uh, PET, steel, aluminium, uh, glass even. Um, and, and, and if possible, if, if they're naturally um, regenerating systems, things like bamboo, um, perfect. I mean, that can be regenerated. Wood is actually a very great way um, to um, use... Um, a material that's actually carbon captured and then you've locked that, that uh, material, that carbon, into the product. Um, so, yeah, th think about uh, where these materials come from, uh, if they can be a part of a circular system or if even better, if they can naturally regenerate. So what I want to do now is um, go through a, a couple of case studies. Um, so this is one of my favorite uh, illustration. Um, it's Adidas and the Allbird. Um, they've actually produced a trainer and they're really proud of this and um, you have to give them some credit where the, they've um, produced a trainer that only requires for a pair of trainers 2.94 kilos of CO2. Now that's still quite a big number because actually the, the pair of trainers um, only where only weigh 0.5 of a, a kilo, so you still produce six times more CO2 than the actual weight of the product, and, and this is again an illustration of um, of how little we instinctively understand uh, CO2 as, as a as a byproduct of uh, what we're manufacturing. Um, yeah, and it's difficult to see. It just goes up in the atmosphere. We're just difficult to measure, weigh it as a gas. It, it, it is difficult to um, uh, visualize. But anyway, the, the, these guys uh, set out to making um, a really good ultralight running shoe without compromising the, the performance of, of the shoe. And um, you can see on the uh, um, tongue of the shoe where actually they begin to um, highlight the uh, scope one, two and the three um, uh, type of missions that, that have been produced. Now the average um, uh, 
CO2 amount for your normal trainer currently in production, at least for 2021, I'll look these figures up, is actually 13.6 kilograms for, for a trainer that weighs 0.5 of a kilogram. So you can see going from 13.6 to 2.94 is a fantastic jump. Um, and that's going to make a big difference. The, the market for uh, trainers is between 15 and uh, 19 billion pairs uh, sold uh, per annum. If you bear in mind, there are, what, 8 million, billion people on, on the planet. I mean, it does make a difference. If all manufacturers were to adopt this, it makes a big difference. In actual fact, um, shoe trainer manufacturing um, globally re represents, I think, just under 2% of all the uh, CO2 emissions. So something that seems almost irrelevant um, in terms of uh, CO2 becomes quite big. And this um, goes to illustrate one of the misnomers that you know, it doesn't make a difference. It does make a difference, a big, big difference. So we, we got companies here um, that are trying to look forward, um, literally taking the next step. How, how, how they did this was actually they reduced, uh, first of all, the number of materials that they were um, utilizing in their uh, design of the trainers. Um, and then sourcing the materials wherever possible from uh, recycled materials. And uh, I say again, this was done without compromise uh, to the performance of the material. I mean, if once this is scaled up, there's no reason when you're using recycled materials to make uh, um, shoes, why it shouldn't be cheaper uh, rather than being more expensive. My next illustration is um, the, the humble ketchup uh, plastic uh, bottle. Now, the bottle itself is made from uh, PET. It's got a very low um, sort of melting point of, um, and therefore you don't need much uh, energy to recycle the bottle itself. Where, where the problem comes is that the, uh, the top uh, is made from polypropylene, but um, um, it's got a little silicon insert. So when you um, squeeze the bottle, um, and the little insert acts as a valve and uh, it dispenses the right amount of uh, ketchup. The, the, the problem there is that we've now fused um, a silicon insert into a polypropylene um, housing. And um, if you were to try and melt it to recycle it, I mean, this is the old version of the um, uh, top, then actually you, you've got contaminated um, uh, polypropylene plastic, which uh, can't be utilized. So you've got no choice uh, but to throw it away. So it's actually very difficult to recycle because of that silicon insert in, in the top. Now, the Heinz uh, ketchup uh, people took it upon themselves to re redesign and set themselves a challenge to redesign that top. And they've managed to do it. It's taken them, what, 45 iterations. Um, they still have uh, a two part solutions, but they're now uh, both made in uh, polypropylene and it's now recyclable. And it's uh, now got the lowest uh, carbon footprint of uh, any ketchup bottle. I mean, but the same technology can be applied um, if it's honey, mayonnaise, you name it. Now, to, to produce a polypropylene pellet that normally goes into a molding machine, just to produce the pellet before you mold it, um, you will produce 1.6 to 2 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of pellets. So there is again, um, there's always more CO2 that's produced than the product that you're left, uh, left with. I mean, and it doesn't sound much, but Heinz ketchup sales alone, and just uh, this is just Heinz, um, there are many other producers of uh, ketchup out there. Um, I mean, they, they sell 650 million bottles of ketchup per, per annum. Um, so I don't know what the overall ketchup and mayonnaise, honey, these bottle sales is, but it could be close to multiplying that, I guess, by 10. So you, again, we're in the billions. 
it makes a difference. But this was done with clever engineering. It is possible. Um, and companies that have got ESG um, uh, tendencies um, will try and find uh, solutions, um, again, with engineering know-how. The, the next example I wanted to share is um, Renault Trucks. Now, what they've started to do uh, at an industrial scale is to recover resale parts from their used uh, vehicles in a circular economy push. Um, so some of the parts are recovering will actually find their way into the new truck manufacturing line. Um, so they will reuse uh, parts in new vehicles. Um, they will obviously refurbish and resell parts uh, for service. Um, they're also looking to modernize existing trucks and extend the life. Um, and particularly where actually the thing is maybe just broken, um, then they'll send that material to uh, recycling uh, or local foundries to um, re remake, use it as raw material. Now, now trucks uh, account as the second largest uh, polluters, um, 20 Two percent of all transport-related emissions. The biggest one is still cars. I think that's uh, just over um, forty percent. But what's not on the slide here is the next step. These trucks that already exist. There are some companies now that are removing the um, diesel powertrains and uh, beginning to put uh, either electric or um, hydrogen cell um, uh, powertrains into the trucks uh, without creating a, um, a new truck. So a great example of that is uh, one in um, in Silverstone in uh, Northamptonshire, uh, Lunaz. Um, I think they're known for um, um, making or converting classic cars into EVs, but actually their core business is um, um, electrifying um, garbage disposal trucks uh, um, for, for local um, authorities uh, collecting rubbish. I can imagine, um, even with Renault, um, that they will take what seems something that's niche, it will become mainstream. Um, there are already examples of, of that are beginning to happen. The last example I want to share with you is an automotive example. Uh, it's Polestar. No, Polestar only make um, EV cars. They were set up as a brand, as an EV brand. They're um, owned uh, actually by the Chinese who bought out Volvo and um, they created this um, uh, brand Polestar, EV only. And, and I think you'll see more EV only brands uh, uh, coming to the fore. But what Polestar have done is set themselves the moonshot mission, as, as they internally call it. And they will, their mission is to eliminate, not reduce uh, greenhouse gases, uh, but to eliminate them all, scope one, two, and three. Um, so where are they now? Um, they're doing quite a lot of research and uh, they've established a number of collaborations uh, in the uh, supply chain. Um, and with energy companies. Um, and they know they can't do this alone, uh, and they're working with uh, like-minded uh, companies. They're hoping to have um, a supply chain and a pilot line um, up and running in order to validate uh, their products that they're going to have uh, with zero um, CO2 E uh, production. And they um, have set themselves a um, um, production start for 2030. In the meantime, what they are doing is also encouraging uh, um, owners of current vehicles to keep them longer. And I think they've moved away from uh, more year changes um, um, in, in order to entice uh, people to get the next uh, model year. They really do want customers to keep their products as long as possible. So what are the takeaways uh, from, from these uh, four cases? Um, so as engineers, the takeaways are, are these. 
right? Specify as few types of materials possible. Because the more you specify, uh, the more different types of materials, the more difficult it's going to become, the more complex it is uh, to be, um, it becomes to handle at the end of life. Mm. Less types, but also less, less of it. I mean, it's quite easy to err on the side of caution without doing your um, um, structural analysis and, uh, and, and just um, having more than you need. But that is uh, a waste. I mean, it's uh, over-engineering uh, and uh, it's not always uh, necessary. So creative, proper, detailed, well-thought-out engineering is essential because you will use less material. Um, the companies that I uh, spoke about, they understood where their material was coming from, their sources, or, or, or they're, they're developing that understanding more and more. So as engineers, we should all be trying to um, understand the providence of that, that material. Mm -hmm. Co-molding, whether it's the shoe or the ketchup bottle or um, parts on cars, if you co-mold things together, it becomes really difficult to... Um, um, recycle or uh, reform and that's also true of carbon fiber sometimes it's the only material that out there that allows you to produce the, the product um, there's never a right or wrong answer but you, you know if we do have to use co-molded material like carbon fiber then uh, think very carefully uh, and make sure um, that is necessary so the automotive industry has moved away a little bit from uh, carbon fiber and also now trying to find ways of um, recycling some of the uh, um, carbon fiber panels and uh, components that have been uh, already manufactured. Increase their longevity by design. Uh, I've said that several times. Um, absolutely understand end of life process, whether it's recover, reuse, recycle, uh, avoid. Um, that going into land, uh, Phil. Um, engineers now need to understand also, uh, I mean, that unit of uh, CO2E and be able to quantify in the way that I've talked about the automotive industry, how much CO2E is produced um, during the manufacturing process or um, in the using uh, user process um, phase of the, the, the product. Um, this is something that um, engineers need to understand in the same way they understand uh, millimeters, newtons, pascals. We need to understand and, and internalize um, CO2 as, as a unit of uh, measure. Also, the, these, these products that I um, spoke about, um, none of them have actually compromised the performance. So... Again, dispelling some of the uh, myths out there that um, uh, we have to make allowances for um, sustainable products. Uh, they're sustainable, but uh, okay, they won't work as well. Not true. And to be honest, uh, the, the public um, you know, won't accept that. Um, it's, it's a bad business model if, if you're relying on the public to um, um, show you good goodwill. Maybe one or two people will, but... The vast majority won't. It has to work. No compromise. So that's a quick run through. Um, if you want to learn more, then there are two modules. Uh, module one uh, is the uh, re-engineering for a circular economy. Um, th there's a lot of um, legislative uh, pressures and uh, also incentives and um, um, the, the way that the circular economy has been monetized now, um, carbon credits and so on. The, the, we need to be aware of how all these things work uh, in, in order uh, to understand the circular economy so we can take advantage of uh, taking materials and um, uh, engineering uh, products in, in the right way, the most sustainable way. So that's re-engineering for a circular economy. The um, module two, a sustainable product uh, life cycle design. Um, there, there, there's some traps um, when you're engineering something in a sustainable way. 
Um, as engineers, we want to be creative and um, e each product needs to be the best performing product that it can be. But, but actually, they're, they're, they're traps uh, that, that go alongside, the, alongside that. We don't always need to uh, re-engineer something that already exists. Um, in particular, uh, thinking in ways of module, module engineering, for, uh, one module working for many products. This is something that we explore here. And also design for manufacturing assembly um, and for sustainability. This is something that uh, we give more practical uh, examples and uh, uh, how to do, how to approach um, in the uh, design phase of um, a product. Whilst thinking again in um, product and uh, production uh, systems. Okay, so the um, next course is um, Reengineering for Circular Economy is on the 20th of June, uh, a few months away. Um, and likewise, the Sustainable Product Lifecycle Design, 28th of uh, June. Um, these uh, courses will be run from number one uh, birdcage. Um, uh, I suggest that if you're interested and you want to design things in a more sustainable uh, way, there, there's a uh, a myriad of examples and um, methodologies and uh, much more know-how and uh, how to approach that. So where are we now? We come to the q and A. I've uh, gone through this quite quickly. So I'm going to stop this slideshow and um, hopefully I'm going to hand over to uh, Dan. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for that, Tom. Um, yeah, there's a number of questions and uh, comments that have uh, come through on the chat and a few more coming in. So we'll, we'll just kind of uh, try and work through all these until we finish at uh, around half past. So uh, the first question is, is the 20 to 30 tonne CO2 produced by a typical car per year over its lifetime or how many years life is assumed? Right, right. Okay. So um, the calculation normally assumes uh, 200,000 kilometres. 200,000 kilometres. Yeah. So over the lifetime, really, then, yeah. Yeah. If it's a full, full lifetime. Mm -hmm. Cool. Excellent. Nice, easy one. Um, there's a comment here saying that the McKinsey stats are interesting. Uh, do you have a source for that at all? If you go on the web and uh, go into the McKinsey uh, website and uh, you just... Uh, um, do Google searches on, um, um, uh, I mean, there's a reference actually on the presentation, I thought. But, yeah, I mean, if you um, um, do a Google search on um, CO2 footprint during production or, or design stage, you'll not only find uh, McKinsey, you'll find uh, a few other uh, research establishments that have come to um, the same conclusion. Um, they're consistently getting this 80% during the uh, design phase. Well, what's interesting is um, during, during that design phase, uh, in terms of the development costs of uh, making uh, or, or tooling the product up, you've probably only spent about 5% of your um, uh, budget. That first 5% is absolutely critical uh, because that pretty much locks in uh, that 80% that early design phase and setting the right targets and uh, getting the right concepts is, um, is super important. Very good. Uh, quick one. Uh, is there a specified way of labelling products, a green or footprint label? Right. Um, th th this is also interesting in, because uh, many um, industrial bodies uh, have got their own um, sort of... Uh, green labeling um, um, sort of authorities. Uh, when I last looked um, for, for products, there's about a thousand uh, companies that offer some sort of uh, uh, labeling. Um, some, some companies like to collect them and collect these labels. Other, other companies just try and reduce the um, CO2 and trying to get to net zero um, so they can be uh, audited. And, and I think um, 
the ISO 9000 type uh, audits are where um, companies um, are, are claiming and it can show um, the, the data, um, the, the reduction program, uh, and uh, making it transparent. For me personally, I think that's a better way to go than um, trying to get a company uh, to give you a, a label, a badge that you, you're somehow green. Many of these companies are, are doing it because it's a, it's now becoming a business in its own right, um, giving these badges out, saying that, yeah, your product has been made in a green way. And very often, um, they're only partial, partially true, uh, because if they're only looking at uh, scope one and two um, CO2, um, their claims may, may be right for scope one and two, but not necessarily right for uh, uh, scope three. So it's a bit like the Wild West out there at the moment. Um, there are so many companies offering um, these uh, green credential labels. Um, I, would, I would take a pinch of salt <laughs> with them. Um, I hope that helps answer. I mean, but this is my personal, my observations, my personal opinion that I've developed over the last uh, years or so. Very good. Um, this is more of a comment, but we'll get your thoughts on it, uh, Tom. Uh, it amazes me that we are saying the worldwide average of new trainers purchase are two per person per year. Surely it's better to discourage such more such purchase for fashion and make trainers that can last longer. But the problem is the profitability side of the balance. Uh, so rather a, a, a statement than a, a question. What were your thoughts on that one? There are undoubtedly uh, fashion statements. Um, so so <laughs> I don't know how many of those uh, trainers produced actually uh, people go running and jogging in. Um, but but I, but I do know that a lot of um, um, fashion manufacturers in particular, I mean, I've actually worked with the, the Paul Smith team. Um, and, and they they very clearly don't make trainers for running. They're, they're, they're fashion um, uh, trainers. But but I know that they've adopted a similar approach. So uh, Paul Smith and these um, trainers, they will now only use recycled uh, PET uh, materials to, to make the, um, the, the materials um, for, for the, the, the trainer sort of shoe body. Um, so they're, they're also adopting uh, this type of thinking. Um, are, are we going to stop fashion? Probably not. So um, it would maybe nice if we all didn't buy so many um, and, and avoid buying them. That's, again, we're going back on top of that uh, pyramid. So if you can avoid and, and just ask yourself, do I really need another pair? I mean, that's a good thing. Um, we can all do that. And if 8 billion people did do that, then we wouldn't be buying 16 billion trainers uh, uh, per annum. Um, but then when they are purchased, if the manufacturers can dramatically reduce the amount of CO2 um, produced, that's also a good thing. There's no, very rarely, and do I ever see a silver bullet for reducing uh, CO2 and becoming more sustainable? It's always a multifaceted approach that's required. Um, and that's probably one of the most common uh, questions I get asked. What's the one thing I need to do? <laughs> well, th th there's not one thing. There are many things that need to be done um, in order to get to um, carbon uh, net zero. Um, and it will require many steps. <laughs> Back to the uh, trainer pun. Very good. Right, we'll crack on because there's quite a few questions coming through, so we might have to be a bit selective. Um, question here, if rental refurbish and resell components, are they just passing on their carbon footprint? Well, the components have um, locked in a, a carbon footprint. So you, once you've manufactured the thing, all the energy that's gone to manufacture the, that thing is now, it's been produced, it's out in the uh, atmosphere. It's, it's there, it's done. So having having produced that thing and, and uh, having produced all that CO2, 
then what Renault are, are trying to do is keep that thing, that component, that axle arm or, or whatever, um, in, in uh, service for as long as possible so it doesn't have to be produced again. Um, the thing they're trying to avoid is to um, um, have it have it remanufactured. Um, so certain industries are becoming quite good at this. Um, so if I've done some work with Network Rail. I mean, they, they, they've got some really big uh, forgings and castings um, that really don't wear out. I mean, they, they can have a new bearing uh, put in them and they're good as new. So there are industries that are now beginning to realize that not only is it more sustainable, but it's actually uh, economically more viable. And as carbon taxes and tariffs start to come to um, the, the fore, then the, the, the economics of these circular activities um, will work better. I mean, unfortunately, things have to be monetized. It has to work financially as, as well as uh, uh, being sustainable. And this is why... I mean, I showed one of those first slides that we engineers have got that dual mission now of uh, managing costs and sustainability simultaneously. But but they need to be aware. We all need to be aware of um, where those tariffs are, how they work, um, and what legislation is coming over the horizon. Because there will be a, a bunch more coming. Cool. Uh, question here, do you have a recommended data set or database for lower carbon materials which shows GWP as well as technical properties? Well, there, there are numerous LCA um, um, databases. Um, the, the, the Scandies now, I mean, before, a couple of years ago, I mean, to, to access these databases, um, you'd probably need to um, uh, pay a little bit of money. Um, the, the, the Scandinavians are probably slightly further ahead and they're um, open sourcing these uh, databases. If, I mean, I haven't got them to hand at the moment, but uh, if you come to the course, and please come to the course, I will uh, uh, direct you to uh, um, some great databases uh, which are free free to access. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're life cycle analysis type uh, databases where each of the materials... Uh, uh, and how they're produced uh, will we'll have all the uh, uh, data sets uh, attached to them. What, what I normally ask to, or what companies normally do is they try and take stock of what they're doing today. Now, what is it they're producing to, today? Um, they can estimate it themselves. So you, you don't necessarily need to do an overly complex uh, uh, LCA analysis uh, very often. You can get a rough estimation. Once you've got that, then um, the question companies and engineers need to ask themselves, what is it that we can do to start to reduce it? And that's where the uh, um, the, the value and the, the, the sustainability thinking starts to happen um, once you've got that stake in the ground. But, yeah, I mean, the, 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 there's a lot of data out there for free. Um, and there's a lot of consultants on uh, LCA now that will, will spend a, a lot of time with you uh, to, to go to the uh, sixth decimal place of uh, how much uh, CO2 that you're producing. But but actually, it's not always necessary. Um, just in case, Tom, uh, LCA, just in case nobody understands the reference. Right, right analysis. Okay, thank you. Which, uh, if you come to the course, uh, we uh, spend a few hours on going through life cycle analysis. Uh, on the both uh, mo both modules, we touch on that. Cool. Uh, again, a statement here, but again, we'll get your opinion. Uh, mastering and optimizing production materials is the essential step needed to be taken by engineers. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, yeah. Knowing the provenance of the material, I mean, if you can source it from a, a recycled uh, source, then fantastic. Um, BMW now, I work for BMW and, and I'm still connected uh, to them uh, with, with some of the work that I do. 
Um, they have a policy where engineers, first choice material has to be from a recycled source. Their first choice. Um, what they want to avoid is um, getting fresh material dug out of the, the ground. Um, but they're doing that without compromise to safety, performance, um, and they're doing it in a way where they're absolutely trying not to uh, create other uh, other issues. Uh, maybe maybe a word there. I mean, it, a, a lot of recycling, particularly electronics, that happens in Africa where copper wire coated with PVC and uh, PCB boards, uh, electric electronic boards, they. they containers of these broken you know electronic screens and so on they, they get dumped somewhere in Africa and I mean, there's a couple of massive recycling centers and uh, what they do out in the open air is um, um, yeah. strip the plastics off and out in the open in a very toxic way so I mean the reason I mention this is because you have to be careful even when you're getting recycled materials. I mean, you need to understand the providence and that supply chain. I mean, the fact it's recycled isn't enough. You, you need to understand mm -hmm. where, where exactly it comes from. Companies like BMW are doing that. There you go. Uh, quite a broad question here, but is it easier to recycle metals or plastics? Well, I mean, my, my favorite plastic is a PET. Um, that is much easier to recycle than, than uh, um, steel or uh, aluminium uh, b because its um, that melting point is so low. I don't want to quote it off the top of my head, but um, because the melting point is so low, we, we, we're talking probably 100, less than 100 degrees, um, the, the energy required to recycle it and, and make it into something else um, is easy. So, I mean, we, we have a lot of people saying all plastics are bad. That's not the case. Um, PT is like a, a, a wonder material that, that maybe we haven't exploited enough. And not only um, can you make it into another plastic bottle, but you, you can make fabrics uh, from them. So, a lot, a lot of fabrics now, uh, automotive fabrics for your seats. With fire retardants are, are made from uh, old plastic bottles so it's the energy that you require to recycle it i suppose is what i'm really saying here but i mean as engineers we, we still need the properties of the materials um, uh, to, to do the job um yeah i mean i mentioned carbon fiber i mean that's a really difficult one to to recycle um and to, to reform and that, that's why there's been some move away uh, from what i can observe very good uh a few more questions here we'll get through as many as we can uh can you recommend a good online co2 calculator engineers can use to get an idea of emissions involved in a product's design well we're back to uh, lca um so those LCA databases. Um, as I said, there are some open sources out there, but I mean, essentially what they're calculating is, um, um, what they're telling you is how much CO2 is, is produced in making the, 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 the material from, from raw and then the material from uh, raw. What I, what I implore most companies to do is to Start to build their own internal databases, engineers. So you'd be amazed just how much uh, information you can glean. Um, <laughs> I don't have a violent agreement there. No. <laughs> uh, right, about five minutes late. Um, as engineers, we will design for circular economy, but the local authority cannot process it or manage rather sells rubbish, also burns it to produce energy and calls it. We support circular economy. Will this denial, with this denial, how can we be reassured and motivated? 
So yes, yeah, some of the so the, the English are there. I think what you say is there a, a conflict between the circular economy and the local economy and local authority. I think they're beginning to align even more now. Um, um, certainly, if we look at where we are now, to say ten years ago, that meant that's uh, recycled by local authorities. I mean, it's a, a massive, massive change. Uh, the, the amount of sorting that we do now. Um, I, I think we're, we're going in the right direction. The, the, if you go to Scandinavian countries, then uh, they're, they're probably another five years ahead of us. Um, and and uh, some, if you go to the US, then they're maybe 20 years behind us. They, uh, I, had, I had some friends there that um, had just moved over to what Texas. Uh, they were putting their uh, trash out and they were trying to segregate it. And uh, the neighbors laughing at them. Well, what are you doing? Um, so, so to some extent, we're, we're on we're on an educational journey, and the local authorities, certainly the UK, are going in the right direction. We're not in all the way there yet, um, but they're also um, uh, independent uh, bodies now that understand that actually they can make new materials out of recycled uh, uh, products. So it isn't just local authorities that we need to, to rely on. There, there are companies that have established themselves in, in order to do that recycling for certain specialist materials. I think that's always been the case for um, steel, aluminium. There, there are a number of companies that have been established for a, a long time making green aluminium, for example. A couple more if we can. Um, is design for manufacturing becoming more of a continuous process with the increasing changes driven by reach and similar legislation? Um, right, I'm not sure about the reach uh, bit, but d design uh, for, for manufacturers uh, and assembly is really, really important uh, because the, uh, the, the joining uh, technologies and the decisions that engineers need to make uh, about, um, you know, essentially bringing components together so, so they, they work as a, a um, as a product system um, are, are really, really important. So when design for manufacture and uh, assembly, uh, now when we uh, go through those methodologies, um, we bring in now the uh, sustainability part. It's a factor that initially... Um, was ignored. So um, my colleague um, Harvey Leach and I, when we go through design for um, MAX, we put X there because it, it, when designed for many things, um, it's not only manufacture and assembly, it's also sustainability for the planet. Um, hopefully that answers that. I'm not entirely sure if I've answered it. Okay. Well, well, we'll have one last question, which goes back to your previous field of expertise. Um, what are the best ways of reducing CO2 emissions for the bodies of cars? Because light materials like aluminium, stroke, carbon fibre have higher manufacturing emissions. Well, it's an interesting one. Since I started the industry, um, the, the, we're always looking for the big alternative uh, to to, to steel, where it was some sort of composite uh, uh, plastic, uh, aluminium, carbon fiber, but but steel, honestly, it, it's it, it's probably the best that, that we have uh, for for car manufacture. I mean, and it's so predictable. I mean, um, the, uh, the the way it behaves and um, how we can model it. Um, it it is very much understood and um, with the higher carbon steels uh, to, to get the additional strengths um, very often they're, they're matching uh, the, the performance of um, um, uh, carbon fiber I mean for, for, for me personally my observation is that um, steel is going to play still a massive role um, uh, aluminium, I mean, it's a third of the weight, and sometimes you just don't need that structural rigidity 
that still gives in, in uh, some uh, car panels, particularly bonnets, for, for example. But you, you want the bonnet weight, the, the front end of the car to be sometimes uh, lighter. Um, so, so, I mean, having less weight is less to propel, uh, uh, propel um, which is always good. We need le less energy. There's very rarely one, as I said, silver bullet that um, do this and all your CO2 and sustainably, uh, sustainability woes will, will be um, de defeated. That's never the case. Uh, things are complex um, and we, we need to look uh, and understand the thing that we're trying to design and um, uh, produce and how, how the uh, user is going to engage with it. Um, but but certainly for uh, automotive, then I can't see how steel will not play uh, or continue to play uh, a big part. I mean, if I go to um, uh, it's aviation, then I, I can't see how aluminium or those products derived from aluminium um, will not continue to play a big part. Some carbon fiber, but as I said. It's problematic when it comes to recycling, but hey, there's a there's a challenge, uh, an engineering challenge. Um, get more cost-effective ways to recycle uh, uh, carbon fiber. Uh, crack that uh, egg, and um, I mean, there's a business to be had. Profitability and sustainability. Uh, back to the slide that I showed. Um, it's a dual mission. They go hand in hand. Excellent. Well, Tom, we've, we've come to the end of the hour, so I think a uh, very informative and very well received uh, presentation looking at the questions in the chat. Unfortunately, we've not had a chance to answer all the questions, uh, but I guess we can all give you a virtual round of applause. Um, as mentioned by Tom, there's a number of courses that we run which cover these topics in more detail. Uh, I've put a link into the uh, chat for the website where there's a raft of information on training and other helpful bits of information, previous podcasts and previous webinars, etc. Uh, but thank you for everybody for attending. Uh, thank you again, Tom. Uh, hopefully we've answered the majority of the questions and everyone's found it a very useful uh, one hour of their time. And uh, thanks again. And uh, hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.